Welcome to this week's edition of the Religious Studies Project. We have a discourse episode this time all the way from Australia with some very familiar faces. We have Professor Carol Cusack of the University of Sydney, Ray Radford also of the University of Sydney and Associate Editor of the Religious Studies Project and I'm Brianne Fallon of the Sydney Jewish Museum and also Associate Editor of the Religious Studies Project. Welcome Carol and Ray. It's wonderful to be doing this again, Brianne. Thank you, Brie. It's good to see you again. Well, Uh, even though, yes, it has been so long, we should let everybody know that we are currently in lockdown. But before we get on to some articles in the news about vaccines and lockdown, I'd like to start off with something that's not so COVID connected, which is an article Carol actually brought to our attention, which is something we discussed a couple of episodes ago also in a discourse edition that we did, which was about some legislation in Victoria and the idea of it being anti-family and anti-religion. Carol, can you fill us in on where we're up to with this particular article? The reason I selected it is because it's not mainstream news. It's on a website called Mercator Net, which is conservative. And I think that the interesting thing about it is that it broadens the scope. Like, I think for for listeners who are outside Australia, you may not know this, but because we've got three levels of government, we have a federal government, which is conservative. Every one of the states has a state government as well. And at the moment, the state government of Victoria, which is led by Premier Dan Andrews, is, I would say, the most progressive state government we have in the country. And it's in Victoria that we've seen issues like banning gay conversion therapy, which we were, in fact, discussing in our previous podcast, I believe, Brie. And so what we've got here is a larger piece by Andy Mullins arguing that the pattern of legislation emerging from the Andrews Labor government in Victoria is actually anti-family and anti-religion. Now, this is a bigger claim than anything that could come out of, say, a single bill banning gay conversion therapy, because a lot of religious people actually don't think gay conversion therapy is a good idea and believe that it is a violation of human rights and so on and so forth. But this is about some things that look pretty good for progressives, but which are being read differently by religious conservatives. So, for example, these are amendments to the Equal Opportunity Act. So it's not as, it's not like the gay conversion bill, which was a distinct separate piece of legislation. It's about an existing piece of legislation. And the Attorney General in Victoria, Jacqueline Symes, was actually discussing these amendments to, for example, prevent the display of Nazi symbols. Now, I think Ray might have something to say about that, particularly given the protests against lockdowns recently. This was linked, obviously, with arresting the progress of neo-Nazi activities in the community. She also proposed extending anti-vilification protections beyond issues of race and religion, which are the only two things that are presently in the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria. and also to give the vilified um, access to court in order to fight back against those who were um, hate-speeching against them, shall we say. And the point is all of that sounds great to left-leaning or liberal, open-minded progressives, but the argument that Mullins makes is that what it does actually is restrict the presence of the, of religion in a whole lot of areas like schools and workplaces because it also involves taking away some situations in which, say, pr- people with a particular faith orientation get preferential employment. And, I mean, again, that does that sounds reasonable. Um, you know, Brie, you work at the Jewish Museum, which is a magnificent institution, but it doesn't employ only Jewish people. It has a team with a variety of religious and non-religious affiliations. Um, but amongst the very conservative wing in Australia, this all is very disquieting because typically and traditionally 
our churches have been exempted from equal opportunity legislation and exempted from um, any form of affirmative action program to employ, say, women or people of colour because they've been allowed just to employ whoever they like. It's a really interesting article that um, Andy Mullins has written, Carol, as you say, because it's kind of coming across as kind of a full form ideological attack and the language is, that is used is sort of parents cancelled, religion cancelled. And there's this sense that, as you say, that there aren't these sort of protections that once have been there. And because, as you say, it's on sort of a kind of left of field media outlet, there's kind of this kind of idea that he's pulling back the so-called curtain on this ideological attack that's going on. The thing that I think might be a good way of explaining to our listeners how very full on Mullins' article is, and I think Bree Wright reading out those subheadings, religion cancelled. What about the thing at the end where he says, brothels will be able to exclusively employ prostitutes and those sympathetic with prostitution, but faith-based schools will be prohibited from employing only persons sympathetic to the faith of the institution. Look, I have to tell you, I actually think that sentence alone, uh, two sentences, uh, really undermines the article. It shows um, it, that really, that that's an extraordinary claim. Just imagine a brothel that organ- that employed a whole lot of people who said, "Oh, sorry, actually, we won't provide sexual services." Yeah, we have jobs here. You're going to pay us all, but no. It's I think just silly. There's also another line in the article which we will provide for people, which is the kind of attack on the cons- consultation process for the conversion therapy ban, and he you know, says that the Andrews government uses human rights as a smokescreen and it has a sham consultation process for conversion therapy. And the idea of human rights that comes through quite strongly in this article, which is really quite interesting because another article we'll talk about in a moment also brought up human rights as a central concept, is that throughout this article, different articles actually of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are mentioned, Article 26.3, for example, and the idea that parents have the right to choose the kind of education that should be given to their children. And there's this kind of interesting balance between the idea that human rights are being used as a smokescreen, but then they're also being used as central for the argument for why these things are potentially a problem. So there's this interesting kind of balance of using kind of the left smoke screen against them in the article, which is kind of interesting. Um, but something that's come up quite often is uh, Christian symbols, the use of the crucifix, the idea that Jesus is my vaccine. And this is sort of the, the segue onto the second article that we're going to talk about today, which is will there be religious exemption for vaccine? And what's the history of that in Australia and how we're kind of tracking with that so far? As I understand, there's only one example of a religious group being exempt from vaccines in Australia. Is that right, Carol? I think so, yes. Um, But it's all very complicated because we have real difficulties here If you let even one group, even a very minor, tiny group, have an exemption, it opens the space to a raft of other groups arguing that they too should have an exemption. Now, the problem with that is that if the group is large enough, half of their members will get vaccinated anyway because they don't actually have a big issue with vaccination. It's just the noisy minority that are really going to push strongly back against it. And I mean, I guess we also have to have a little bit of a discussion here. Lockdown has exposed some real fracture lines in Australia around class, because the people who've suffered most in terms of COVID infections and COVID deaths have largely been in suburbs that were less economically well off, where often extended family groups live together and where the younger people in these households were counted as essential workers working in service industries and having to go to work, largely also because the families simply were not affluent enough to have members not working. And you have, therefore, this real kind of thing. Now, again, I think most rational people know that the gulf between rich and poor has been widening in most developed countries and that Australia is no exception to that. But the thing that's interesting about the anti-vaxxers 
is that as well as the religious groups, there are, in fact, a kind of wealthy, upper class, very well educated pockets of people that appear in certain areas. I mean, the most obvious and most publicly discussed one is Byron Bay on the North Coast, which is like a very affluent area where the vaccination rates are radically below the um, uh, broader community for and every for kind. COVID and not COVID vaccines as yeah, well. For every kind of vaccine. And the other thing that's very important is that no religious exemption is invoked by those people. The exemption is more of a human rights, individual freedoms kind of exemption. 100%. And the, the one group that has invoked that Christian or that religious exemption is Christian scientists. So in 1998, they were granted an exemption to the federal government's no jab, no pay laws. So in Australia, children have to be vaccinated to go to childcare and receive family benefits. That's the one exemption that we have. These fracture lines, Carol, that you've brought up in terms of socioeconomic status, obviously in terms of Ray's work, we've also seen fracture lines in terms of different groups, in terms of lockdown and these these conspiracy groups rising. Ray, is that something that you think has been worsened by vaccines being made compulsory in certain workplaces, for example, and it's something that has brought more conspiracy groups into the public eye? Um, yeah, definitely. I think it's also one of those things that the, the people have been able to join together with. Um, this is what I was going to bring up, that there's another whole about, you know, forced vaccinations and all that kind of stuff has led to a whole group of anti-vaxxers now longer calling themselves anti-vaxxers because that's a, that's a bad term. They're now pure bloods. Yes. Because, you know, they haven't been, and it's like, oh, that's slightly Nazi, if uh, Nazi era, you know, blood and honor, blood and soil, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, you, you, you go, you go call yourself that. But like the, um, the Melbourne protests of last week, the week before, how long ago? Time is a blur. Um, you know, with, where it was all the tradies and then it turned out that it wasn't actually tradies. It was just people wearing high vis. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of people who, have been instigators in the past who have been, who have all photoed at these CFMEU trade meetings and that kind of stuff or protests. And it's like, well, they're not tradies. They're just one of them was that, um, witch, the Bunnings witch from, from last year, uh, who wanted to hex Dan Andrews. She was there in high vis and it's like, okay, well, interesting. But yeah, I think it's sort of, um, it's definitely brought a lot more out of the woodwork, so to speak. Yes, 100%. And it's kind of brought, I think, the idea of, as you've kind of said, we have people who are out in high vis claiming to be one thing and that kind of reflecting on, on a larger group of people. And in this article that was been published by ABC News, this idea of, of religious exemption and whether you can prove that somebody did something truly on the basis of their religion, which is protected under anti-discrimination legislation, is something that's come up with this idea of a religious exemption. Um, Carol, can you give us more a sense of what it would mean to have a, a religious exemption for, for vaccines and the controversies ar around that? All right. The first thing we have to say, I just think this might help people who don't know Australia well. We have 25 million citizens, roughly, and 974 people said they were Christian scientists in the 2016 um, census. And we've just done the 2021 census, but the data isn't available yet. But the Christian science community is very small and it's also ageing. So there's a particular demographic there and giving them a religious exemption, in my opinion, really doesn't count to very much. The only thing that is a problem is if they are seen as a gateway for other groups to be able to claim a similar kind of exemption. Now, what you just raised, Brianne, is one of the things that Ray and I talk about all the time. The big problem with religion, one of the big problems with it, there, there are millions, is that if people think, as so many non-scholars tend to, that religion is really all about sincerely held belief, the problem with that is that you can't actually know what anyone believes. You can look at their actions and if their actions involve claiming a religious exemption, 
and saying that they can't be vaccinated on account of their religious beliefs. We've got two possibilities in the courts, and the courts could say that they actually think that these people really do believe this and therefore they should have the exemption that they ask, or they might come to the conclusion that they don't really know what the people believe and so they can't. Now, we have other cases where this is more pressing. So, for example, refugees are the really obvious one. I cannot return to my country because I have converted to Christianity and I will be potentially killed if I am sent back home. How sincere is the conversion? There's some really interesting work done on refugees and religion. Uh, I reviewed a book a couple of years ago that made a very interesting article, at least one chapter did, that these new Christians who've converted in countries like, for example, Pakistan or Afghanistan, um, when they're questioned by immigration officials, they often don't know very much about Christian doctrine. And it doesn't mean that they don't have sincere beliefs. It means that they don't have the kind of education that someone brought up in a Christian school and adhering to the Christian faith as an adult in a European country or a country like Australia or America would have. And then often they have been sent home because the assumption is that their conversion is not sincere. And so I think the minute we have to look inside a person we have a lot of problems legally. So as you can, can, we, you, you, you and Ray both know, the general argument is that public health has to trump any idea about individual freedom. And I know, Ray, we were discussing this on Facebook a little while back and you actually said, well, you weren't per se opposed to religious exemption. No, so this needs to be a few caveats, I feel, you know, things like, if you're going to be against the public health orders, then maybe just stick to religious affiliated hospitals. You know, don't go clogging up the public hospitals when you eventually get COVID or sick and, you know, end up taking beds away from people who don't have COVID or, mm-hmm. or who need it kind of thing. So, cause that's one of the big problems in America and well, yeah, mostly America where people who are anti-vaxxers then get COVID then end up taking beds away from people who are sick and vaccinated and, you know, like easily fixed problems. So it's like I was reading a thing about a guy who broke his arm and had to wait two weeks before he could get into the hospital to get it fixed. There's another guy who got shot and had to wait, you know, a day in um, on an ambulance trolley. I was trying to think of the word. And Gurney. Gurney, there we go, before he could actually get into, like, into a hospital because all the beds were full for, from people with, with um, COVID. So... It's kind of like, well, you know, if you don't take the shot, go find, you know, like a religious affiliated hospital that can look after you. Even though like in Australia, all the religious affiliated hospitals are private hospitals, which means there's a longer waiting list. So And greater cost involved. And greater cost. Because you have to have private health insurance to have your surgeries or your treatments covered. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting concept because – This article, which is raising this idea of a religious exemption, at the moment, it's almost been sort of taken out of everybody's hands because we have in Australia public health orders that are kind of, you know, vaccinated and unvaccinated. And without this religious exemption, you kind of fall into one of two categories and your freedoms are based on that. We should say before we kind of move on to just quickly what um, one of our former justices Michael Kirby says about this idea is that Christian science, who we've mentioned a couple of times as the one example of the community that has the exemption, religious exemption based on vaccines, is that in the article, they actually state that they're not anti-COVID vaccine and they're actually getting it for the benefit of everybody. So it's interesting that, that there isn't necessarily a consistent point of view there based on what is going on with public health. But as I just said, former Justice Michael Kirby, who's quite a prominent uh, figure, and I will say I'm biased because I do know Michael personally through the museum, he really warns against this idea of excessive protection of religious freedoms. And it's a quite a strong article. And 
in the article, there's a number of different sort of statistics that are put out how useful they are. It's hard to say. It states that 70% of Australians say religion is not personally important to them. But I'm wondering if we can just get an overview of this article from you, Carol, because this one was your suggestion of, of Michael Kirby's point of view here. I just thought it was interesting because, I mean, all everything that we're talking about today in some sense is like a continuation of stuff we've talked about before. And we did talk about this idea that Morrison and the federal government, our conservative prime minister, wanted to introduce a religious freedoms bill. And the reason why this article by Michael Kirby came to my attention was because the religious freedoms bill kind of got stalled because the pandemic stopped so many things. And it's just kind of perhaps struggling back into the public eye. And I just thought it was really interesting, too, because it ties in with Andy Mullins's piece um, about Dan Andrews's legislation, partly because in both articles, the Rationalist Society of Australia is mentioned. And I think that this is this is a group that have become more prominent during the COVID pandemic as well. They send me emails now. Uh, I, I had never heard personally from them. They have a, at least one member in the Victorian Parliament as an independent. They are pushing very strongly the idea that if you're non-religious in Australia, you should come out and say you're non-religious in Australia. I think, Ray, you probably have some thoughts on that too. What, coming out as non-religious? Well, the idea that because it was part of that whole thing about the census as well. Mm. Don't write down your Catholic just because your grandparents were. If you never go near a church, then don't. Yeah, straight no. But, I mean, wasn't there a whole thing about this year's census where none wasn't an option? You had Like, atheist didn't mean none. You actually had to write down none or no religion. Um, And that that was a bit of a source of contention. I think that... There are always questions about the order of the religions that you can tick box and the box that says other, um, because loads of different things might mean no religion, like secular or rationalist or atheist or agnostic, you know, and these things are like not necessarily designating connection to any group. But I did think it was really interesting that the rationalists are popping up all over the place. Mm. Yeah, I'd never heard of them until these these um these articles. So well, well, they're going to start sending me emails. <laughs> well, this idea of sort of the the non religious movement, I think, leads us on to our final article, which is a nice one to kind of finish off with after we've talked about controversial things like Nazi symbolism and anti vaxxing and things like that, and that is. Christmas and consumerism and Australia opening up just in time for us to spend an awful lot of money, you know, on the shelves of of the church of consumerism, if you want to call it that. Ray, let's start with you. Opening up just in time for us to spend a lot of money. What do you think? Uh, I have basically, as soon as lockdown happened and we were unsure how long it would go for, my argument was always we'll reopen for, before Christmas anyway because, you know, because of the love of consumerism. And that wasn't just me being cynical because I work retail on weekends and, um, you know, at least I have it okay. It's a bookshop. So that's, you know, slightly nicer than other retail places. But um, I don't know. I mean, it's, we needed to re- reopen at some point. At least we're reopening. I mean, we're reopening next week um, on the 11th of October. So we got a couple of months before Christmas, at least a month and a half. But yeah, I think you know, like the vaccination rates have actually once once that whole system started getting rolling, and they managed to actually get it going to a point where you know you could go and get vaccinated at chemists or um, your GP and all that kind of stuff. You know, we've, we've, it's working a lot better now than it was you know three months ago when all of this really happened and nobody could get a vaccination anywhere, regardless of the government constantly going. Get, jab, get vaccinated, get a jab. But, um, yeah, hey, we're reopening. Yay, now we can have a life again. And it's interesting you say you're, you're, you're not cynical oh, about, no. about, <laughs> about the reopening. Um, I, I'm not sure about you, Carol. Um, 
the way that it's been framed, this reopening, was always that it was for Christmas so we could be with our families and it's a time of togetherness and faith and this sort of thing. You know, cynically, I see that as kind of as a smoke screen for our economy needs the money of Christmas. Where are you, Carol, with your, with your cynicism on this one? Look, I think that it's such a funny sort of question. Um, I'd like to take up Ray's point about vaccination rates. You know that we still only have 45% of the population double vaxxed. I actually checked the online vaccine tracker this oh, morning. Oh, Australia. Before. Yeah, for the whole of Australia. So that doesn't count the people who've had the single dose. And it is absolutely true that for months the government said, go and get vaccinated. And in fact, there were no vaccines in the country. I mean, or hardly any. Um, AstraZeneca or nothing, and even then not perhaps great numbers of them. Thankfully, we have acquired dosages from Pfizer and Moderna and various other places, and now people can get vaccinated. And, in fact, it's happening reasonably fast. Our home state, New South Wales, has done very well, actually, in rolling out vaccinations. But I think nobody's quite sure about this reopening thing, partly because the numbers of new cases are still pretty worrying daily and the deaths are worrying. And I mean, obviously, again, around the world, our listeners may think that we're being kind of precious snowflakes here, given that our infection rates and death rates are actually very low for around the world. The thing about Christmas I think it links nicely with the last article from Michael Kirby because it is a massive secular festival. I mean, it's a festival for everyone, really. And even the the groups that don't celebrate Christmas, there are other festivals that occur around the same time, like Hanukkah, which is very holy for the Jewish community. And just because our laws have arranged it, that the Christian inheritance of Australia means that all the public holidays are around Christmas and Easter, It is. And it's summer. And last summer, there was this thing about, oh, heck, we're not going to be able to control COVID anymore because it's easy to keep people locked up indoors if it's grey and freezing and there's nothing really for them to do. But it's a fine weekend. Everyone's going to rush to the beach. Now, that's already happening. So in terms of the, you know, the secular celebration of Christmas, do you think this is one example where actually secularism is winning out rather than our Christian heritage in terms of Australia? (laughs) I truly don't know. I think Ray is right. It's largely about economic stimulus. And as you said, we have to go out and spend enormous amounts of money at Christmas in the temple of consumption. And it's interesting, you know, because I've made a lot of radio programs over the years And Christmas and Easter are two times when everybody rings up and they say, can you do 10 minutes telling us a bit about the traditions and a bit about this and a bit about that? And it always gets really difficult at the end when I get asked, so what are you doing for Christmas or Easter? And I I always sort of think, "Uh, nothing. I mean, my family get together, but my second sister, many a very sensible woman, many years ago, utterly banned present giving. She just said, we've got so much stuff and we don't need any more stuff. Let's stop this. And about five years ago, she banned birthday present giving as well on the same basis. Like, it's just ridiculous. You know, we go out and we buy each other stuff and it's stuff we don't need and you just just forget it. And I'm really comfortable about that. You know, I I don't mind. Getting together with the family, yes. Seeing a few friends on Boxing Day, maybe. New Year's Eve, I've always absolutely hated and wanted to avoid. You know, know, there's a study in there somewhere about (laughs) how COVID has affected what you do on Christmas. You know, is it more about being together than it is about the stuff? That would be an interesting study to do. Well, all I know is my my oldest brother and my nieces live in Broken Hill, and so they can't come to Christmas again this year, which means I get to nap most of the day. So uh, that's my Christmas plan sorted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's I a good one. Entertaining, do- uh, uh, entertaining Uncle Ray for a, a bunch of overactive uh, seven-year-olds. So, 
Well, team, we might uh, wrap that up there. I mean, it's we've talked about so much this episode in terms of COVID and symbolism and vaccines and consumerism, but I'll let you both go and enjoy what's left of your lockdown because we'll be out in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you both so much for uh, your thoughts and opinions on these current affairs issues, and we'll see you on another episode of Discourse soon. Thank you, Brienne. Thanks, Brie. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Andy Alexander and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter and David Robertson. Our features are edited by Savannah Finver and our opportunities digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews. Video editing by Alison Isidore. Podcast transcription by Jaden Bartashius. And social media managed by Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes and all other portals. Thanks for listening.